So uh, thank you for your patience with the changing agenda. I want to just uh, walk through what we're going to do, council members, and we're going to move the agenda around just a little bit to accommodate um, a couple of people who have to leave our meeting early, most notably Marlene, who is on the phone um, <coughs> and has been hanging in on the phone very patiently all morning, but has a local urgent uh, school board meeting herself that begins at 11. So here's our plan, council members, if I could just direct you to your agenda. Um, we're going to uh, jump down to the Oops, me. item number Sorry. four which are reports of the various uh, subcommittees and work groups that we have. Um, we're gonna start with Marlene, and we're going to also add a, a brief update from Krista Rude about the State Interagency Coordinating Council, which we asked her to keep her eye on for us, and um, some activities there. And then we'll come back up and um, uh, approve the minutes and get we'll, we'll jump back in uh, the order of the agenda. I promise that we will be out of here by three, um, and we will catch up time as we go. We have a plan for that. So um, thanks for your patience. Those were all really important topics this morning, and I hope that you will infuse your thinking about those topics throughout the remainder of the day as we have our conversations. Lots of good conversation to break about them. All right, so we're going to jump right in um, to agenda item number four, and uh, we'll ask Marlene to get us started. Thank you for being patient. Questions for Marlene about our equity committee. Let me just say I have had several um, uh, folks uh, from OEIB and from the governor's office and other places compliment the council um, on its charter <coughs> to the equity subcommittee and uh, for our determination in actually making this actionable and putting together a toolkit to make it actionable at a local level. Um, so uh, thanks to Marlene and all members of that committee for doing that work. Um, let's move on then uh, to Dana. We have a joint uh, work group with the Oregon Health Policy Board. Thank you, um, Pam. So I just wanted to give three key pieces on... Teresa, can you help? <laughs> Go ahead. Everyone's going to have to call back in. Let me double check the code. 
Okay, great, thanks. Just go ahead, Dana. So there's uh, three main updates from the Joint Early Learning Council Health Policy Board I wanted to speak to. As you know, this council and the Oregon Health Policy Board adopted a set of recommendations for this committee's work over this uh, current year, and all of those are underway. So the first I want to share is that... Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> Um, I had the opportunity to join Pam Curtis and David Mandel on a presentation to the Metrics and Scoring Committee, which is the statutorily uh, placed committee that makes decisions on the CCO accountability metrics or quality incentive metrics. Um, and the proposal that we delivered that was on behalf of those recommendations in the Joint Committee was to um, propose that the CCO Metrics and Scoring Committee consider adopting a measure of kindergarten readiness to be a shared measure that crosses our health system and early learning system and allows for the, dry, the strategies that we work on together towards a shared um, agenda and outcome. Um, the uh, proposal was that we um, look at 2014 kindergarten readiness data um, to set a, um, a uh, benchmark uh, for where we are and that we go back to the metrics and scoring committee to talk to them about what that measure would look like and what targets would look like. Um, I would say that it was um, really an exciting moment to have a conversation like this which is truly outside of any historical context to be talking about having a health system being considered accountable to an outcome that has been more traditionally considered an education one. I would not say that this conversation was exactly easy. It, you know, it <laughs> opens people's minds in a way that perhaps they haven't considered. We clearly had a lot of supporters and a lot of good thinkers about how would this actually work. So we look forward to this ongoing uh, conversation. Um, I would like to say thank you to Rob Saxton. He um, uh, gave, or supported our work to get um, uh, in the next step to be able to uh, work across our agencies, a health agency and Department of Education. Um, to have data sharing agreements in place and security agreements in place such that we can ultimately report out to a CCO their population's kindergarten readiness um, results based on the kindergarten assessment in 2014 that will be much more meaningful them to understand their exact population that they're accountable to. So thank you for that support. Um, the second piece I wanted to speak to, um, as you might recall, in addition to the thinking about a measure of kindergarten readiness that could be shared, the joint subcommittee discussed a, a goal to have a set of measures that cross over or span multiple areas of child and family well-being. Um, we are in the midst of moving forward to create this work group that will ultimately advise the Joint Early Learning Council and Health Policy Board on a recommended set of child and well-being measures. We have over 44 nom uh, nominee uh, requests come through spanning a broad set of education, early childhood, health, human services, um, and public health. And so I'll be working with the leadership of the Joint Committee hopefully over the next week to make a final plan on the, the, the work group structure and we'll be getting that work underway over the next month and a half. Um, the final one, I just wanted to state, one of, for me, one of the exciting conversations in our last joint policy board meeting was a discussion um, bringing back the, the um, idea I moved towards a family well-being screening tool. Um, this is something that I think many of us feel very strongly about. It is important to identify those families who may be um, uh, at risk for um, the best environment or supporting those children's earliest learning needs and health needs and um, an early way that we can identify how to best wrap the uh, right supports around families in this early learning system. So it is certainly not a done deal, but it was an exciting time to reinvigorate the conversation and be looking to Pam for kind of how we move that conversation forward. And I think the joint, the joint subcommittee will be readdressing that at our next meeting. So updates. Questions or comments for Dana? As a CCO board member, how is that going to show up? Great. Well, I think one of the um, really exciting parts of the conversation we had is that we actually were merging conversations that are happening on the early learning side as well as on the health side. So within um, one of our presenters was actually a CCO representative who was talking about how they are working across the Portland metropolitan area in implementing a family well-being screening tool in prenatal clinics. Um, and so 
one of the conversations is how do we work and collaborate together across health and early learning? What are the key elements or what is a shared screening tool that might move forward? And those are where the conversation started. So I think we all recognize that um, the opportunity to implement screening for this purpose could be broadly spanned across health and early learning and likely should be. And the goals for, I think, our next conversation is how do we move forward and collaborate? Pam, do you have anything to add to that? No, I think um, how I would imagine it showing up, I'm not a CCO board member. Um, how I would imagine, yeah, how I would imagine it showing up is you all in at CCO boards needing to discuss if if there can be, if we can reach agreement, which I think we can, on a common screening protocol and a common screening tool, how you implement that in your community and what that means, not just for your CCO, but your community partners. <coughs> I mean, does this, do you, does it get implemented? I'm not making this up, but just in your provider community, your health provider community, do you guys do it at the CAP agency? Um, if you do it at the CAP agency, can they get credit for it and their metrics? It's those kinds of conversations that I would imagine you're going to need to have. Yeah, so. I'm... Yeah. <clears throat> and I, th I think at a state level, there are things that we can do to help facilitate not only those conversations, but those connections which is the purpose of this joint committee. But it's going to, at some point, drill to how do you actually make that work. Other comments or questions for Dana? I would just add that from the conversations today and last night for council members, this um, the developmental origins of health and disease that we heard Dr. Thornburg talk about last night and again today, I think that joint subcommittee is an appropriate place to resurface this issue. And so I don't know, and you're planning those out, but I would just request that that gets placed on our agenda again. We had him come and present, but he presented and we just sat there and went, oh my God. <laughs> and then it is the mother's fault. <laughs> but then we need to go. <laughs> but then we need to go uh, yeah. to what, make it actionable. Um, and that's a great place to talk about it. All right, any other questions or comments for Dana? All right, let's go to Bobby then and the Child Care and Education Work Group. Um, so uh, our group has um, four things on its plate and I'll go through it quickly. Uh, the definition's coming back to you in June, I think. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's something, uh, <coughs> you know, fill up the agenda so we can't, we're ready to come back. Um, and Bobby, remind everybody the definition of. Oh, thank you. The definition of quality, affordable child care, and what's and you saw a first draft and gave us great feedback, which we were able to implement very quickly, except for the graphic. And I can't tell you how hard that has been. And we're coming <laughs> back to you with the best we could do, and we don't really think it's good enough. But it really is as far as we could take it. So it's ready to come back to you. So it wasn't easy to take and put that the content of that uh, paint, short brief into a single graphic, which, anyway, we'll talk about it in June. Um, the next one is we have a group working on kindergarten innovation, best practices from the early learning side. And they've got a first draft, and so it won't be very long before that comes back to you. Um, we uh, are, have a group working on integration of early learning programs, and um, I just can't tell you the amount of progress the state has made since that group started last year and where we are today. Uh, the integration of Head Start Oregon Pre-Kindergarten with uh, early intervention with uh, community-based programming. and. What we perceived as barriers last year have gone way down and we've seen real progress. So that'll be an exciting report to bring because there's been real move. Um, move not like where, where we want to be, but we've made progress. And then uh, the fourth one we're working on is new on um, reviewing the policies that are coming out of the Office for Child Care um, that we're still figuring out. They've had, they have a very lengthy, intensive process of gathering information, and we have to figure out when 
the council starts becoming part of those conversations and um, we're working on that and uh, staff have done uh, Lisa and Kelly have been um, doing work but it, um, that one is still in process so those are the four things we're moving on comments or questions for Bobby are you ready for any of those other topics to be at the June um, meeting in no, terms of? No, no. Okay, we'll so keep still for now. now. Okay. Oh, the, just, the closest one would be kindergarten innovation best practices, but I think we we'd be better to keep working on it before we bring it to council. Thank you, Norm. I was just going to comment that a couple of times today we've heard uh, in various of our reports, and, and Bobby just said it again that the difference between a year ago and today, um, right. and I'm thinking back to the first time we got together and we were all sort of looking around the room at each other like, <laughs> we've got this mountain that's 30,000 feet above the oxygen level, how are we ever going to get there? And we're just starting to hear about breakthroughs and it, it, it's very refreshing. Yeah. The Pendleton Report, uh, the Early Learning Center, uh, and people are just really coming together. It's very exciting, and it emphasizes the word that Bobby just used, perceived barriers. Other comments or questions for the child care worker? Okay, thank you very much. We'll look forward to June. That will be an exciting report. All right, uh, Krista. Um, can you just remind council members about why uh, we have this on the agenda? Because we asked Krista to do something. I, I just want to make sure that you remember what we asked Krista to do. <coughs> Thank you, Chair Curtis. Um, at the last meeting, uh, I updated you on work coming from the state interagency council, coordinating <coughs> council. Um, there, out of House Bill 3234, there was uh, a request that this council um, make recommendation to legislative bodies about rulemaking authority for the EIECSE program um, relating to whether it should be with Early Learning Council or, this, or stay with State Board of Education. And there, at the last <coughs> meeting, um, I had just attended my first official meeting in this capacity and um, learned that there are forums being conducted across the state to um, gather input about this work. And so um, I promised that I would come back with a list of those times and dates. Um, and I just, as of yesterday, received that. There are still just a couple of missing details, but the most hot off the press uh, information that I have is now available to you and I'll pass that information around. Um, and so there's just an opportunity for um, folks to participate in that. The executive committee um, at the SACC meeting um, shared um, their approach and it sounds like um, there was some feedback and what will end up happening are um, kind of a structured presentation that will um, be the same across the state and that will allow for feedback um, from <coughs> folks who attend and participate. So it's, it's an opportunity to take note of. Council members, comments or questions, Bobby? Um, the, so the, dis, the I, I'm just thoroughly confused about the question is the relationship between the, the current council and, and the early learning council, part of which we dealt with in the last legislative session when we didn't move early intervention into the early learning division. And what's the, what's the topic in the forum? Asking people's opinion on whether they think early intervention should be kept separate from the rest of early <coughs> is that that's what they're going to ask people and to talk about I don't I don't believe that's um, the executive committee was working on how to best set up the question my understanding is they're asking for hopes and concerns the actual um, the actual legislative mandate was a recommendation um, that the authority adopt rules and uh, wait let me find the right section I was misreading but it was also about how there um, should be <coughs> coordination regardless of where the authority lies that there would be coordination or how that might be so I think that the point in going out to the field is to ask 
for folks' hopes and concerns about how coordination could happen and to get feedback to bring back. That's my understanding. I know that the executive committee was still working on the presentation and um, we're hoping to have a finalized version very soon. As you'll note that the um, first meeting is actually next week. So I think that they're still in process. And so if we had thoughts, we could certainly bring that back. So I'll just say the obvious and oh, the whispers that I hear around the table. Council members at the last meeting when you talked about this, uh, I think we collectively expressed a, a great deal of frustration about this, uh, about not about the legislation, it is what it is, uh, but about the fact that the SICC is going out to gather information about rulemaking authority for um, early childhood programs without involving the council um, and has created a presentation about what that could look like without engaging members of this council, which is the statutory early learning body. So we asked Krista to attend those meetings and to report back to us so we could at least keep uh, a, a, uh, some level of understanding about what it is that they're doing. And I would anticipate that uh, once they've completed, I, I think we ought to encourage everybody, um, you all, others in your communities, to go and attend these <coughs> conversations. Um, and then I would hope that at the end of this information gathering when there is a report, that they would be willing to come and talk with us uh, about their findings um, and about their work. Uh, but that's, uh, I think that's where we, where we had took this last time. I Janet. did get my official appointment to be a member of the SIC. Okay, so Janet had applied. I have it up on our fireplace. <laughs> <laughs> so you are now a member of the yeah. group? Okay, great. So we have. But I haven't, there hasn't been a meeting since that happened that I have attended. But Great, thank you for telling us that. So do you know who is facilitating these meetings? There was a conversation about hiring um, a facilitator, but I think that they have members of the SICC who will be, and I think in some cases the group called FACT that works with families um, is going to be acting in some places as um, facilitators, but they're still in process of, I think, making those final determinations. Council member, other questions, comments, or thoughts about how we should proceed with this at this time? Lynn. So I'm just confused. SIC, but that's normal. SICC is for what? EIECSC. It's the Early Childhood Special Education Programs. Right, I know that, but what is the entity that's convening this? State Interagency Coordinating Council. And who runs that? It has representatives of parents, Early intervention, early childhood special education providers. And it's staffed by the Department of Education. And, and it's appointed. by you guys. Mm -hmm. So is there any reason that the early learning department can't have an official designee on that organization's? We, we did. That's, so we that's you. Yeah, that's Krista we is our Krista designee from okay. the department. So you, and you get to vote or you get to have a say. You have some role to say. So how did the policy or how did the document get written without involvement by the early learning department? The executive committee met to create the document or to create, not, not the document, but to create the presentation after it was presented at the SICC. Um, I, there was a lot of comments from a variety of folks on that work group, but they, uh, and in the SICC, and I provided some feedback to them about things I thought they could change to make their presentation more, but I think it started when I was just becoming a part of that group, and there hadn't been a designee before that, so we kind of came in at a time point that was So are after. we clear now in the future that anything proposed, articulated, or documented that we have a voice at the table? Is that clear? And I mean, if Janet. it isn't well, clear, we have two. and now we have Janet's appointment. Right, I mean, I think we, I think that needs to be, that's our operating assumption, <laughs> is that we have a voice at a table. Otherwise, we're talking about wasted effort, wasted, wasted money, and duplicative uh, administrative process, which is what we're telling other people to get cleaned up. Absolutely. So if we're all clear on that, and that's in the record, then that's my operating assumption, is that we have a voice, that we see documents, and that we have a, a, an opportunity at the table to influence the policy. 
So I think that w I think that's a great operating assumption. I think we're going to have to rely on Krista and Janet to promote that operating assumption because I'm not sure it's a shared operating assumption. And I, so. I would encourage you to draft it in writing and submit it at your meeting. And if there is a response that it's not appropriate, that we bring it back here and we address it. Because these are the kinds of things that will pop up in the legislature and make problems. And we'll all spend time and there'll be a lot of meetings and it won't make one hill of beans worth of difference for any kid. So I, I, I think you have to be assertive in this role um, and, and be very clear and put it in writing. Rob? I guess Sorry. I would just be really curious, you know, sort of what's the comfort level with the presentation that's going to be made at these meetings and its sort of even-handedness about um, presentation. So, I, you know, I would think it would be really important about what that presentation looks like, how it's facilitated, and to make sure that there's... Um, that when this work is done, that whatever is heard from the groups that participate, that that people can say, we feel like this is, we feel like what we got back is valid. So, I would just say that th that those two points specifically regarding the content for the presentation and the facilitation are exactly what I advocated with after the fact, um, and I believe that there have been changes that have been made to the presentation as a result not only of my comments but also um, other members of the SICC, and I uh, believe that the executive committee of the SICC is reviewing the presentation. It might be a good thought for me to go back and ask if we could see it in advance of that time too and I'd be happy to take that request forward so I think I it's think you hear this council Krista and Janet saying please be assertive on our behalf yeah. because if we don't we're missing uh, not only are we and they missing a really important opportunity but we actually go backwards so if we if you all need help we can provide that help Rob? So exactly what I was going to say is if you if we get a look at this we feel like it's not going to be what we need it to be in order to get decent um, results from it and if there's any way that I can help please let me know and I'll be happy to weigh in. Will do. Thank you. Anything Thank else you. council members on this topic? Okay we're going to jump back now to the beginning of our agenda. <coughs> Um, and I think I, I failed to gavel us in, so in arrears, I'll just gavel us in. Um, so my apologies for that. Uh, we're going to turn to the approval of our minutes, which should be under tab one or two, one, right. in your notebook, <coughs> council members. Um, so we are now, as an action item, considering the approval of our minutes from both April and March. Madam Chair, I move approval. Great, thank you. We have a motion and a second, second. Uh, to approve the minutes for both April and March. Is there any discussion about these minutes? One more time, any discussion about the minutes? Any objection to approving the minutes? All right, minutes are approved. Thank you very much. Um, do we have council members who are on the phone? Okay, I know both Marlene and Dick uh, indicated they needed to leave around 11. So one more time, any council members on the phone? <coughs> or, okay. Or who else is on the phone? Well, well, we may have a variety of public. Okay. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> so uh, council members, then let's, uh, let's move to council member updates and or reflections from our wonderful visit um, in the in the community here yesterday, our, our dinner conversations last night, our uh, presentations this morning with the State Board. Reflections or updates from members of the Council? Terry. Um, last week, was it just last week? Uh, D Dana and I uh, were asked to present at the um, Future of Public Health Task Force about the intersection of um, early learning and public health. This is a um, task force that was formed out of the last legislative session to really talk about um, what public health should look like in Oregon. And um, so we did that presentation and um, had a lot of really good, interesting questions about the role of public health in early learning and how that works together. And do you have more to say, Dana? Um, I, I would just add, I mean, I haven't been following that task force conversation throughout the process, but from our one meeting and conversation on this point, I think it's very clear that as I'm navigating transformation efforts across health and early learning that um, there's 
likely going to be a new look to kind of what the future of public health looks like, and it really sits in the center between our health system transformation <coughs> efforts and early learning. And so I think there's ongoing change, um, and it's important, I think, for the council's and local hubs work ahead, and I think we should stay attuned. Sorry. Thank you. Council members, other questions, or excuse me, other updates <coughs> or reflections? Excuse me. <coughs> Madam Chair, you and I had a brief conversation in the hall that uh, I think probably all of us would share that uh, the presentation this morning uh, was very valuable, and I'm sorry I missed the other piece last night, but the uh, upshot of it for me was that uh, there's only one human being here who can only be in one place at a time, and that uh, perhaps some kind of a condensed WebEx version of, of that work would be a useful tool particularly if we were following up on Dick Withnell's suggestion uh, and we're going to take this uh, with appropriate spokespersons to everything from chambers to rotaries to uh, other uh, interested parties and thinking about business champions that might join in the hub work uh, making this linkage between uh, health and education. Uh, it would be pretty impressive to see that um, uh, boil down to 30 minutes or less, it just just to invite people to the bigger conversation. Well, and I committed to following up with Kent to see what resources they have and what sort of interest they have on their end <coughs> to doing it. The, the folks who have been working on it at OHSU are fairly steeped in the science of it all, um, but there's an important message that is um, needs to be delivered. I'd follow up on that and say that I appreciate Dick's desire to pull the private sector into this. The public sector is not, and public and nonprofit sector are not negligible. I think I think that there, there's a real important message as someone in that sector. There's an important message for us, um, and and to open the kind of doors we talked about in the last uh, report. Um, so I think. Well, however that's done, it needs to be not focused just on one side, yeah. but it, it, it really needs to be all of us that are aligning that. Excellent. So I think Dr. Thornburg is like a rock star because he's really <laughs> cute and he's really, you know, he's, he's a great yeah. communicator in a very natural, non-threatening <coughs> scientific way. I mean, I think he is an asset. I think the presentation that he does C could be like his pictures and stuff could be reformatted a little bit to really be a rotary lunch presentation that that would just like go viral right. and I think that if so if we paired some communication d uh, visual stuff with his stuff and then put him out there it would be you know amazing city club everything so I, I the only thing I would do is I'd put his his vi his media stuff and I'd I wouldn't turn it into Disney, but I'd shift it a little bit. Other reflections or updates from council members? Well, I want to just take the opportunity to again thank our uh, hosts uh, at Intermountain Mountain ESD, but also the folks who participated in our bus tour <laughs> yesterday. It was a, it's always a treat. Um, to visit programs where there are live children, as one might say, um, and the opportunity to interact with them. Um, in particular, we had um, a really uh, interesting series of presentations and updates about what this community is about, and it's exciting and thrilling um, to see and to hear about. And uh, I just want to thank Radine, Brenna, Cade, and Kathy, and your staff, uh, all your staffs, for uh, participating um, in our updates yesterday, so thank you very much. We really appreciate it. We learned a lot. <coughs> today was just about butterflies and bugs. Yeah, it was <laughs> for some people. Yes, <laughs> All right, great. So we'll move on then to um, uh, agenda item number five, which is the update from uh, the subcommittees of the OEIB, which we have members participating in each of those subcommittees. <coughs> um, so let me just, on our agenda, first just to start with outcomes and investment subcommittee. One more time, Dick, are you on the phone? Okay, so he's not. I can provide that update as I sit on that committee as well. So um, the outcomes and investment subcommittee is the place where these um, recommendations 
will come from the various subgroups, including us, um, including the Higher Education Coordinating Council, <clears throat> um, and so the various boards and commissions related to the P20 initiative um, for outcomes focus and investment focus in the governor's next budget. And there'll be recommendations to the governor, and he can take them or not, uh, but that is the, that's the, the, the pathway that this will follow. So um, the Outcomes and Investment Subcommittee has been working on a process for gathering input from the various boards and subcommittees. Um, last month, we worked with the staff to create a template, which is included in your packet, uh, for input um, into uh, those the, the, the committee's process. And over the summer, um, the OEIB and the subcommittee will be asking each group um, of those subcommittees and boards, including us, to present top budget strategies and to answer the questions that are in the template that are provided, again, in your packet. Um, one of the critical things that the subcommittee wants to look at is which strategies across all the various boards and subcommittees can actually move the dial on the outcomes that are on the OEIB sub the scorecard, of which you might recall kindergarten readiness is one. So um, we don't want to just look at siloed investments or siloed strategies. We want to look at those that are cross-cutting across all of those boards and committees. Um, and the process is that by the end of the summer, then the subcommittee will have an opportunity to look at all those different recommendations and then prioritize <coughs> them according to um, things like uh, moving the dial, uh, a view of the equity lens, and uh, evidence of potential return on investment for the various strategies that are being suggested. Um, we will bring the full OEIB board the initial set of recommendations at its August 12th retreat, so we're on a fast timeline. Uh, or, and, and we'll ask that you have an opportunity to <coughs> give, um, input and feedback uh, on those as well. So. Until then, the subcommittee is going to be doing a lot more work to gather feedback um, and incorporate it into the final recommendations. And then the final, final recommendations get presented at the September OEIB, uh, OEIB board meeting. Questions? Okay, we will keep you posted at, at, at each meeting and we will let you know um, the uh, the presentation schedule for the Early Learning Council um, on, on our work and recommended investments. All right, so with that, let's go to the best practices and student transitions, uh, Lynn and Kim. <coughs> Kim and I are sitting on the um, best practices and student transitions committee, and um, I, with all due respect to the efforts of the committee, I think it is um, and we're making some good progress. We have a grid that we hold ourselves accountable to. We respond and update everyone there on the advances of the Early Learning Council. I would uh, respectfully submit that I think it is, um, my fear with the committee is that we have a lot of highly intelligent people escalating complexity. Um, <laughs> and I'm impressed by it, I have to say. I. Uh, there's a whole lot of smart people in Oregon. I'm really impressed, and I mean that sincerely. However, there isn't a scaling of that capacity to the resources to implement, execute, and be successful. And so one of the things that I think um, we'll be talking at about in our next meeting is this grid of activities that we're all working on um, is how it fits into the OEIB's broader strategic plan and our, certainly our strategic plan, and then really an assessment from leadership at the early learning level and at the OEIB level is how much of this is gonna happen, how fast for the money that we have and the people and the time that we have. I'm particularly concerned that the cost of the complexity is growing because it's, it's, it's producing the, it's, it seems to me, in my humble perspective, to be making the 40-40-20 objective harder, not easier, and more. It, it can't be perfect if we wait 20 years. Um, however, the things that will happen to the state and the kids in those 20 years are devastating. So that's a piece that I'll be bringing up at the next meeting. I am pleased that we now do have an actual kind of work plan, but 
I'm very concerned that we're <coughs> getting a list of a hundred things to do and instead of the five most important things to do in the next five years with the money that we have so that's um, my report and Kim I welcome your comments I obviously. would agree for the most part I think the big piece that I guess the take back here is the shared piece of the full day kindergarten that is the one component that we're sharing and working on together and, they, and we feel is aligned but the rest of it I would agree there's a lot of information gathering it's nice to have that grid to see where we're at to so there's not overlapping work but um, yeah there's a lot there's a lot that keeps coming to the table questions or comments about this subcommittee I have one the earlier this morning we talked about and Rob was the, very articulate about the importance of literacy and you know aligning practices around mm -hmm. literacy I don't know if that shows up on your grid I don't know if that's going to be prioritized to one of the top five things of the hundred that you're looking at but that just seems to be really critical and is that on the grid is that I mean how does that mean <coughs> it is referenced tangentially in, our grid is long so it has it has multiple pages and multiple moving parts so literacy is a component but the sharp brilliant this these are the three best literacy programs in the country today and here's how we get there um, I can't honestly say that I think it popped out at me I, when you asked your question Norm about what is it that we're supposed I I was like gosh I think that's on the grid but I don't know how and and I will also say that we've seen in the testimony on that committee and this is where the discipline part is going to be very hard is we just love in Oregon to create things and to try them out and to tweak them and that ADD chart that he showed us I thought yeah so we got the pioneers all had that going on because because <laughs> we got it in Oregon in spades so I, I you know you can certainly add to that but I don't I don't see that crisp silver bullet kind of um, articulation in our grid I don't I'd, I'd agree and thank you Pam for bringing it up because I really think that we still are just so high up that we I'd like to see us move down but I maybe that <coughs> isn't the committee but I sure would like to see us developing more just let's move it forward kind of giddy up let's go uh, <laughs> activities then this bringing gathering information and developing the grid and we're looking at mentoring and yeah. you know best uh, mentoring teachers and that kind of stuff so yeah so i maybe do you want us to bring that to maybe we'll bring rob with us i, I don't know council members from my <laughs> what you think but from my perspective that's a take home from that's one of yeah. many take homes yep. from today uh -huh, and uh -huh. that's a place where it needs to show up yeah great so dana I and then rob that. I just wanted to insert to this conversation about the committee and also bridging off of Rob's earlier comments is I hope that as a council and as our early learning team that we um, also can do our job. So maybe not, I heard the, the request for more information about evidence-based literacy programs, but I think we can also do a better job articulating what early language development and early literacy looks like in early childhood because it's different. It's a developmental progression and we play such a significant role in setting vision and policy around that. So what does it look like in the first three years of life? How are we promoting that social emotional development between parents and promoting language in the first years and how that drives up to the important early or literacy programs later? And I don't think we articulate that very well. I don't know about anyone else. I'm just going to speak for myself. But when I go <coughs> to that committee specifically, where we have some very higher thinkers, very intelligent people, I don't feel like I'm qualified or can represent us as be as articulate as I'd like. And I don't know. You know, when we talk about connecting uh, childcare <coughs> and big school and how that's a, a struggle, I think I feel like I experienced that with this group. Mm -hmm. That it's a very much a focus of the big school system um, with not that not that anyone's disrespectful but just that there's this small oh and by the way we better be looking at those little kids yeah that's right but now what are we going to do when we get some so I kind of feel that mm -hmm. so I don't know I it would be I could bring a message back and I feel very passionate about so I think this. you're blessed to bring that message Thank from you. this council and Rob <clears throat> I, I was just going to say I, I appreciate the comment and I it is a concern of mine that is 
you, know, you th think about how <coughs> this gets done and sort of the, you know, how you bake this cake. Um, as it moves through these processes and then eventually into the political process, the, the desire to um, make sure that everybody gets a piece of the cake when it's baked you know, is, is really a challenge and it seems to broaden. I know that you know, I, recently at the department we worked really hard um, to put out the initiative money that came out of the last legislative session. And I believe that those initiatives will move the dial every place that they've gone and every place it's been touched. But there were 33 different initiatives, and within those 33 initiatives, there were hundreds of different uh, recipients, right? And so I just look at that, and, and I think um, if there is a lesson learned, and there are many, but one of them is that just the need to focus on those really key leverage areas and those really key um, investments are incredibly important and it's gonna take um, a high level of discipline. I am encouraged though, as I look at the Outcomes and Investment Committee to think about that what I hope is gonna happen, what I think is gonna happen here is that there'll be all kinds of conversation about the possible that will come to Outcomes and Investments and Outcomes and Investments will get really um, specific about what it is that they'd like to see move forward as an outcome and an investment <coughs> and then that we have the discipline to <clears throat> stick to those things that come out of that. I know um, I'm in front of the Outcomes Investments Committee next week pitching four different ideas, right? And it worries me that um, I'm pitching, that, you know, that the Department of Ed, if you will, is are pitching four. Um, certainly the, the reading initiative is one of those, and, I, and that's really important. So um, just thinking about that, and I hope that's the place where it gets, where it gets um, sort of shushed out. I hope so. But, but it mean I mean it means saying no right it means we can't keep doing everything that we're doing now because there's a limited amount of resources and that the courage to do that is really hard I mean it's hard but we have to do it other comments or questions norm Dana's reminder that it's not just about third grade reading uh, caused me to reflect back on our ESD superintendents uh, comments that he's probably made to more than just Jada or me, but I was taken yesterday with Mark's uh, sort of paradigm shift that um, reading uh, literacy at third grade level is a nine year process uh, and it has various stages, but we've got nine years to get there. And, um, and I somehow would like to <coughs> grab onto that or put a pin in it uh, to, to even cause us to say, oh, uh, it, I know I just stood back for a minute and thought about it, uh, and sometimes we get caught in our own paradigms and we think, you know, why isn't it working my way? And uh, his was an interesting concept, and so you would go through developmental stages that prepare you to be ready for kindergarten, <laughs> that make you a reader by third grade at a level of literacy that is competent, not just checking the box on a state exam. Um, so I don't know where, where he gets airtime, I'm certain at OIB <coughs> and other places, and it's well known to others. He got my attention yesterday, and I just, I'd just i like to think about those. We've got nine years to get ready for reading. Yeah, I mean, that's good news in many ways, yeah. right? Jim said 109 years to mm -hmm. get ready for reading. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Putting them all together, there you go. But I, I, I was struck, um, like Dana was, about uh, what wasn't happening in literacy in the film of the five families we saw last night. We, we did not see adults listening to children talk, which is the big literacy <laughs> uh, investment that adults make. Um, we didn't even see them really talking with their children, yet alone listening to their children. And um, so it's kind of easier to see what isn't there than it is to articulate clearly what it is that um, that that is going to be effective in the early years and I we've talked I think this is the third or fourth time this has come up at the council that we that the, the resources exist and how are we going to go find them um, and but that that that's a challenge that we should take on is making this information because most of these children are going to be seeing 
adults that we don't touch directly. <laughs> you know, right. it's going to be parents and grandparents, and um, so I don't know if we need to, or maybe somebody's already doing it. Well, or and or when we get to our master strategy, let's make sure that we've got a plug for these okay. things. Okay. Because um, that's kind of our to-do list. And <coughs> we'll prioritize our to-do right. list simultaneously in many ways to the, the the outcomes and investment subcommittee and the governor's budget process so we know what we have to work with. But let's at least get it on the map, um, which we're going to spend about an hour and a half doing this afternoon. All right. Was there another comment or question about this? Really important, and thank you for bringing forward threads of our learning as we go. I think that's really important. Um, all right, I think we have equity and partnerships subcommittee uh, to hear from. Uh, Harriet, are you on the phone? I'm just double checking. Harriet? Okay, she was planning to be, so it's all yours, Janet. Well, I kind of say just what Lynn said about this. You know, equity and partnerships, it should be so simple should all be equal. I mean, we shouldn't have this, these issues. And, um, and we do, and it's more complex. I, I am like a simple thinker. And, and it is, there are so many people that have, and different experiences certainly that I've had. And um, at the last meeting I listened to it, I was out of state. Um, there was, a, I mean, the complication of figuring out how to use the request for the um, outcomes and investment subcommittee and who could go and we get caught up in a lot of the details of who could go is this a good time to have these meetings and um, and everybody has an opinion um, <laughs> I was on the phone so I, you know I didn't um, I guess I would urge people to read the equity lens again it's in these notebooks and I don't feel I feel like the committee and people have a sense of how it what it says it is long I wish there was a synthesis of it because it's six pages and it does I almost forget the beginning when I get to the end because it is complex to think about how it all applies um, the, I think there's a concern about how much money that is coming from the Department of Education is specifically tied to issues of equity and the, and the, and the amount of money that really had a tie to a, a view of equ equitable distribution as opposed <coughs> to money that just went out. Um, and then I think an ongoing concern is out of school youth. And whether, this is my opinion, whether high schools can readjust to keep those students involved and interested, or whether other avenues like the GED um, have other benefits for them. Now, if we are doing our job and kids are thoroughly engaged and able to read by three, third grade, they will feel successful <coughs> in school out of school youth may not be a continuing issue for us because kids will be ready for school, schools will be ready for kids. And, um, but they are, it's a, it's a big complex problem and sometimes, again this is my personal experience, I go on the Head Start reviews to other states <coughs> where there is more diversity and it seems maybe it's easier to tackle because the numbers are m more proportionate and we have such a minority of minority people in Oregon, um, I guess it's just, it, it just feels different to me when I'm on the East Coast or in the South where you see people of all colors and ethnicities and, and who contribute equally. And I, so I, I guess I'm just babbling now, but I don't know where Oregon, how we get there. Comments or questions for Janet? Okay. Thanks to all of you who serve on the various subcommittees. It's an above and beyond what you committed to um, doing when you joined the council, both OEIB subcommittees and council subcommittees. So 
really thank you very much. Um, the perspective is really important that you bring, and thank you for bringing <coughs> forward the conversations that we've been having here. So we're gonna shift gears. We have lots of really cool, exciting, celebratory, fun things on our agenda. Not that we haven't been having fun so far. Um, and so next I wanna to shift to the develop, uh, the, the Lynn England Awards. I'm gonna ask Bobby to, to, um, to give us some background and to help present these awards. Uh, but we, you might remember council members, we presented the first one as a council last year. This year we get to present two, which is very exciting. So Bobby. So, um, well, this is a humbling experience here because I really think this award, uh, the council is only uh, representing the, uh, the broader community, many of whom are, uh, that are intimately involved in this award are sitting here because our honoree for this year is Kathy Wansley. And it's such a joy to, to be awarding it to Kathy and even more of a joy that we get to do it here uh, where people have been telling us for two days that she deserves this award. It's, uh, <laughs> and uh, we've just heard it over and over again. So clearly we are only reflecting what all of you uh, already know um, because you've told us it in, a, in so many different ways. But I want to say a few things of, of why Kathy was selected for this award. Um, her leadership, both uh, here and at the state level, and it may be national, although it didn't come out in your nomination, but certainly a lot about your leadership here in, in your own community, about how you took a program that um, served only 100 children and have grown it into a multi-service agency serving throughout the um, geographic area. And I, I think um, the, your actions um, and what people say about you reflects uh, an amazing creativity, uh, the ability to see opportunities, to figure out ways to reach them and the goals in, in new ways. Um, and that ha part of that is that whereas other people struggle to move beyond the world that they live in, and that's why we exist to integrate, you've lived it. Um, so if, if for those you don't know, it, although Kathy heads up a Head Start Oregon Head Start pre-kindergarten program, it includes the Child Care Resource and Referral Agency. It's got a WIC clinic. Um, I'm sure there's CASA. They're now a parenting hub. So they see the mission broadly in an integrated way and not, not narrowly that kind of vision reflects what we are hoping to do throughout the state and we um, the uh, so it's a, a joy at this point in time to be able to give this award to as one person said a tireless advocate and um, you're retiring but I assume that the tireless advocacy is not retiring, uh, that you'll be with us in many different roles. Bobby. I was so excited to talk about Kathy <laughs> that I, uh, so Lynn Angland is also from East of the Mountains. Um, she was a member of the Commission on Child Care and um, on her way to a commission meeting in Salem, she ha um, hit ice 
and or anyway and had a uh, we lost her and um, so this award was created to honor uh, someone who has made an outstanding contribution to children and families through early childhood or learning programs and I can't imagine anybody who more deserves it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I'm certainly honored. And uh, one of the things that uh, Bobby mentioned is, you know, good things do happen to people who wait. <laughs> and I've, I've been in the early care and education for 36 years, and I am retiring at the end of December. But not from advocating for early childhood. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Examples of um, what of this innovative, collaborative, seeing the relationships um, that Kathy has led is um, that that um, she was the first Head Start program to move in, and we're going to talk more about it later, to the quality rating and improvement system. <coughs> and, um, but before we go into that, I'll just take a minute. This year, as Pam said, we have two awards. And the second one is uh, we are awarding to Tina Kotek, Speaker of the House of Representatives. And in, in many ways, this is coming back full circle, because Tina is, um, was in the, the lead sponsor of honoring Lynn after her death. And so it is truly an honor to be able to now turn around and give the award to um, Tina. But she has a long history <laughs> of advocating for children and families and that uh, we are honoring. She started in a food bank and she uh, worked with the <coughs> Um, the Children's First, she became a legislator, and she has a long string of, <coughs> of accomplishments that include ones um, that are directly improving the lives of young children and, and their families, the, the uh, health in health, uh, in the employment-related daycare program. She's working again on it, on uh, how the state should organize itself. And um, so it is a true honor for this council to be able to award um, the Lynn Anderson <coughs> Award to t both Kathy and Tina Kotek. Congratulations and thank you. And I think we are planning to make arrangements. Uh, neither Speaker Kotek nor her staff could be here today. So we're making arrangements to, pro to uh, give her award during legislative days in Salem next week, which is an appropriate way to do it, I think. So uh, we're on a little bit of a roll with our celebration. We're gonna keep, do we're gonna continue to do that um, next, uh, out of order of our agenda, partly to um, be respectful of our guests who are here today in case some of them need to leave. So council members, we're gonna jump ahead um, to uh, item number 10 on your agenda, which is the uh, Head Start uh, QRAS Awards. I'm gonna ask Chris Rood in just a moment. Um, I'm going to ask Krista Rood in just a moment to provide um, kind of an orientation to what has happened um, uh, in order to get these folks ready. But I want to <coughs> say at the outset, um, you'll remember, council members, we awarded um, the first set of star ratings last fall, and we visited um, the very first five-star rated facility in Portland um, and <coughs> made those awards. I think we only have three five-star rated facilities in the state. 
and today we're especially excited not only because we're here in the community um, where we're going to award another one but this is the it's a huge momentous day this is the very first head start program to be five star rated and that is no small accomplishment we were talking about culture change earlier that's indeed a very important part of all of this um, so i'll let krista talk a bit about this the um the facilities and then we'll do the the really fun ceremonies part. definitely the fun ceremonies part but before that I would like to just comment a little bit that on some statistics that help add to the huge culture change that we are experiencing um, Head Starts have been working really hard to participate in this QRIS and I want to just take a moment to recognize all of their efforts and to provide you with some updates about where they are in this process. Um, it's interesting to me, I did an analysis of data um, prior to January 1 of 2013, there were 40, no, 81 Head Starts who had applied for licensing. And as you all may remember, licensing is a first rung in the quality rating and improvements uh, system. Since January 2013, there have been 41 sites that have become licensed Head Start sites, and there are an additional 34 in process. So you had a time period, the first uh, license was Albina Head Start in 1984, so you had a time period between 1984 and January of 2013 where there were only 81, and then in the last 18 months, we are, by the end of June, we should, or in the fall, we'll be up to at least that much, if not more, who have completed licensing. So truly a demonstration that um, times are changing and Head Start is participating in that. In addition, um, the increase in quality training um, for Head Start programs um, has been uh, happening all across the state. Next week, we'll conduct three of them. And at the end of June, there will be 13 um, Head Start grantees who have have completed that and that represents a total of 63 licensed sites who will have through participating in IQT um, come into the QRIS at the committed to quality level and then many of them are working on their portfolios to be five-star rated so having said that um, it's a great opportunity for um, me to recognize you Matilda Morrow as the first Head Start program grantee to participate in the QRIS um, using a streamlined portfolio process that recognizes their federal review as a third-party um, recognition of their existing quality. Um, thanks to all of the pre-work that was done by their program, when the quality rating and improvement folks got to their site, they had completed a uh, portfolio of all the information that they needed, and the evaluators were able to leave that training with completed information for their five-star portfolio. Um, they expect to be done with all of their OPK expansion grant uh, application, or through that grant application, they expect to be done with their licensing for the remaining 10 sites um, by December of 2014. So truly um, a very intentional and thoughtful process for participating, and I'm really delighted to recognize them and all of the work that the Head Start programs are doing across the state. I'd like to invite um, the recognition of their five-star rating at this time. All right, well, thank you very much. It's a very exciting So we actually have, of Yuma Tillamaro Head Start, there are seven of their facilities that have received the five-star rating. We're going to start. Um, Oh, I'm sorry. Just one quick uh, change. I wanted to hand out these updated. We had a we had a miss um, a, a incorrect site. So these are updated forms for the sites, and oh, they are okay. Hermiston Child Development Center, Irrigon, Milton Free Water, Pine Tree, Umatilla, Hermiston High School, Early Head Start, and Pendleton Early Head Start. So we're gonna uh, we're gonna award the certificates for all, but we're gonna start with the first uh, the first. And I think you had an internal competition, maybe a race to see who could get the uh -huh. classes. <laughs> all right. So uh, by go getting those, and I think we have directors for each of these centers with us. So please come up. We're gonna take some photos, um, and we have some nice certificates for you. So um, for uh, Milton Free Water won the <coughs> internal competition, and they were the first five star rated and start uh, in the state. So congratulations. Please come on up. I'm not sure obviously. I'll come and receive there since we were on a bus tour there yesterday. Yes, that's right. And we, we had the privilege of visiting the site yesterday and it was just a fabulous um, opportunity. So 
Congratulations again. This should be the Kathy. This is the Kathy meeting. <laughs> They were first because they turned in their uh, letter of commitment first. Uh, around the table. <laughs> and we have a very yes. large. Oh, wow. oh, wow. So once you come up with this, this is the photo this op. Is the photo op. <laughs> this is the photo op. This is the photo op. Congratulations. <laughs> It's a big it's version of what you have in your hand. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Congratulations. All right, and now, in no particular order, uh, Hermiston High School, early head start. Who do we have from the Hermiston High you School? You know, we have several uh, staff members here, so um, Why don't they come one up of, we'll just have them each come up. Uh, Starla, you want to take up? Uh, Starla, she's our R&R &R director, and great. that's right. <laughs> Helped us through this entire process. And really Heidi is also here. Yes. He's one yes. of our licensors who oh. actually helped that process no. too. Yes. <laughs> so, so congratulations. congratulations. So here's the Harmiston High School. I think we're going to pause for a picture okay. each time. <laughs> this so. is a team parent program with uh, Hermiston High School. Great. Thank congratulations. you. And Hermiston, well, we're on Hermiston, Hermiston Child Thank Development you. Center. Pine Tree Head Start Child Care Center. sharing um, some of your time and wisdom with us yesterday. We really appreciate it and congratulations. So council members, we are going to take our lunch break, but we are going to have a working lunch. So uh, lunch uh, is uh, in the hallway. It's been um, uh, placed there and, and uh, contributed by Intermountain ESD. So again, thanks for being such lovely hosts. It has been fabulous so far, continues to be fabulous. Uh, council members, we <coughs> intend to be back here starting the meeting actively no later than five minutes after 12 which gives you 20 minutes to grab something to eat take a little break and come back we will continue uh, with a working lunch at five minutes after 12. so we are in recess and we'll see you in 20 minutes